So far in our study of biochemistry, we focus primarily on proteins. We focus on the structure of proteins, we discussed how to purify proteins, and also how to sequence proteins. But where do proteins actually come from? In the next 20 or so lectures, we're going to focus on nucleic acids. Because it's the nucleic acids that essentially are used to build these proteins. So what types of nucleic acids do we have inside our body? So we have two types. We have deoxyribonucleic acids or DNA molecules, and we have ribonucleic acids or RNA molecules. And these two molecules essentially are linear polymers of these subunits we call nucleotides. And a nucleotide consists of three components. So we have a nitrogenous base, we have a sugar molecule, and we have a phosphate group. And just like in a protein, we have the linear polymer of amino acids. In nucleic acids, we have a linear polymer of nucleotides. Now, in proteins, the bonds connecting the amino acids are peptide bonds. But in nucleic acids, these bonds are phosphodiester bonds. And we'll see exactly what these bonds look like in, the, in a future lecture. So if we examine, for example, a DNA molecule, this is what the DNA molecule actually looks like. For DNA, because of the structure of the sugar in DNA, the DNA molecule is able to form a double helix formation. And what the double helix means is, we have two individual strands of DNA that run anti-parallel with respect to one another. Now, what allows them to actually form this anti-parallel arrangement is the fact that the bases are complementary with respect to one another. So to see what we mean, let's take a look at the following diagram. So this here is our sugar, the blue section is the phosphate group, and the green section is our nitrogenous base. And this three molecule component is known as a monomer, a nucleotide. And so on this strand, we have one nucleotide, a second nucleotide, a third nucleotide, and on the other strand, we also have this one nucleotide, second nucleotide, a third nucleotide. And what it means for these to be complementary is that these bases here are complementary, meaning that they can form an optimal arrangement of bonds. So these bonds here are basically the hydrogen bonds that hold our bases together. So what holds this entire double helix in DNA are the hydrogen bonds as well as van der Waal forces and the hydrophobic effect. So in the inside portion of our DNA, we have these hydrophobic regions. And on the outside portion, because these phosphate groups essentially point on the outside and they contain charge, the exterior of the DNA of the double helix is negatively charged and it is hydrophilic, while the interior is hydrophobic because it consists of these nonpolar nitrogenous bases. So DNA exists predominantly as a double helix, and what that means is we have these two strands of DNA that essentially run an anti-parallel direction, and they interact via different types of non-covalent interactions. So hydrogen bonds, London dispersion forces, and so forth. The interior is hydrophobic, just like in proteins, and the exterior is hydrophilic, once again, just like in proteins. And these two strands are are complementary with respect to one another. Now, what about RNA molecules? Well, RNA molecules, because they contain a slightly different sugar molecule, they don't form the double helix. They exist predominantly as a single strand, but they can also intertwine and fold to form different types of tertiary and secondary structures. So what about the function of DNA and RNA? So the entire purpose of these nucleic acids is to basically store the genetic code, the genetic information in the cell and use it to build different types of proteins. And when the time comes, when we reproduce to pass that genetic information down to the offspring. So let's begin with the function of DNA. 
So DNA molecules are these biological molecules that store that genetic information. And the genetic information is stored in the sequence of these nitrogenous bases. Because the backbone of the DNA molecule that consists of the sugar molecule and the phosphate essentially repeats as we go from one nucleotide to another. That does not change. What does change is the sequence of nitrogenous bases. And it's within this sequence of bases where the genetic information is actually stored, as we'll see in much more detail in a future lecture. So, the first function of DNA molecule is to store that genetic information and keep it readily accessible to the cell. And what that means is, if the cell wants to synthesize some type of protein, for example, hemoglobin or myoglobin, it has to go down to the DNA in the nucleus and get that genetic code that must be used to then uh, create that protein. Now, the problem is our cells don't actually use that code directly to form the protein. So we don't simply form proteins from DNA. What must happen is we have to first translate or transcribe that genetic code into a code that is readable and can be understood by that cell. And that is where RNA comes into play. So RNA molecules are used to basically transcribe the information stored in DNA into a form that can be understood and read by that cell. So to build the protein, we take the DNA, we essentially transcribe that information from the DNA into the RNA, and now the RNA is used directly to form the proteins in the ribosomes. Now, the other function of DNA is to actually pass down the genetic information from one individual to the offspring. So when we reproduce, we replicate DNA molecules and pass those replicated identical DNA molecules, or actually not identical, they are slightly different because of different types of variations, uh, but we pass them down into the offspring. And the second function of RNA is to actually assist in protein synthesis. So we have different types of RNA molecules. For example, we have messenger RNA, mRNA, and that's the molecule that is actually used directly to build proteins. But we also have other RNA molecules that assist in the process. For example, we have tRNA and RNA molecules that essentially assist the ribosome in forming that protein. So this is the introduction to nucleic acids and in the next several lectures we're going to begin our discussion on the structure. So we're going to look at a detailed discussion of the structure of DNA as well as RNA nucleic acids.